And in the last lesson, we talked about the anatomy of the coronary circulation and the vessels that play an important role in perfusing the heart. In this lesson, we're going to talk about why this blood flow is important and how it's regulated to ensure that there's enough to meet the demands of the heart. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care subjects easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Also, real quickly, I did want to give you a reminder that we have just about a week left on the ICU Advantage Academy pre-order. So remember, with this, you're going to get lifetime access to these videos, all of these without ads. You're going to have access to the notes for each lesson. And I do actually have a little surprise with these notes for members of the Academy. Uh, that's something that's going to be coming up here soon. Um, but along with that, you're also going to have access to the audio-only versions of these lessons. The best part, though, is you're going to be able to earn CE credits for watching these lessons, and then passing a quiz at the end of them. So follow the link in the description or head over to icuadvantage.com forward slash academy to pre-order while you still can before March 15th for 50% off that lifetime access. Now to go along with knowing the vessel structure and the areas of the heart that they perfuse, we also should talk about the physiology that serves as the driving force behind how and why we meet the demands of the heart. So to begin this discussion, let's actually start talking about just blood flow in general. So the heart has the highest demand for oxygen than any other organ in the body. In fact, the heart has the highest A to VO2 difference, meaning that blood leaving the heart has a significant amount of oxygen that's used. Anywhere from 60 to 70% of the oxygen that makes it to the heart ultimately ends up being used up, and this is even at rest. As a result of this, the amount of blood that's delivered to the heart can actually be quite high. In general, about 5% of our cardiac output is specifically going to the heart. Now at rest, the heart gets about 250 to 300 mLs per minute of blood, but once the demand increases, the blood also does rapidly and quite largely. So during exercise, we can see the blood flow increase to upwards of 1,000 to 2,000 milliliters per minute. Now, the microcirculation, which if you remember, are those very small vessels that plunge deep into the myocardium, these are what are responsible for the changes that really regulate coronary blood flow. Now, I'll be talking more in depth about this in just a minute here. And then as discussed in that lesson on the anatomy of the coronary circulation, Remember that the heart is primarily being perfused during diastole. And the reason for this is that during systole, the heart is contracting. And thus the contraction of the cardiac muscle also constricts and squeezes the blood vessels of that microcirculation. So this not only leads to no flow, aka no perfusion, but it can also lead to some mild retrograde flow. Just an interesting point. Now that said, all of this is mostly true for the left side of the heart, so the area is perfused by the left coronary artery. Now both the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery are fed off the aorta, and thus they have the aortic pressure perfusing blood. Now the pressure in the left atrium, and especially the left ventricle during systole, prevent the forward flow of blood. These pressures then drop in diastole, and then the aortic pressure overcomes these pressures, and thus we have forward flow that's resumed. Now, the right coronary artery is feeding the right side of the heart, and this is actually not diastole dependent. And this is because the aortic pressures exceed even the low pressures seen in our right heart. So this actually leads to a more uniform rate of flow of blood throughout the right coronary artery. Now, patients who have ischemic coronary artery disease that really has progressed slowly over time, that they can have a process called angiogenesis take place. And this is something that we also refer to as the formation of collateral circulation. So this is where new blood vessels are formed that run parallel to current stenosed vessels. 
thus increasing coronary blood supply and reducing coronary vascular resistance. All right, so that's the basics of the blood flow. Let's move into something that we term active hyperemia. So the blood flow to the heart has a very tight relationship with the oxygen demand of the heart. When cardiac activity and thus oxygen consumption increases, the coronary blood flow also increases as well. This is something that we call active hyperemia. So the ventricular rate, the pressures, and the contractility all factor into the workload of the heart and thus the oxygen consumption. Now, because the heart at baseline extracts such a large percentage of the available oxygen, there's only a little room left to buffer any increased demand with the remaining oxygen that's left in the blood. This means that increasing blood flow is the primary way in which oxygen delivery can be increased to meet this increased demand. So a combination of downstream metabolites of oxygen consumption, along with local hypoxia causing the release of vasodilatory substances, are what are primarily responsible for this regulation and active hyperemia. Now sympathetic and parasympathetic activations do also play a role in this process as well. So increased sympathetic activity leads to increased cardiac output and thus increased myocardial oxygen demand. Now we do actually see some mild transient vasoconstriction here due to the alpha-1 activation of, on the blood vessels. And this would actually normally be counter to needing to increase myocardial blood and oxygen supply. This response though is short-lived as the increased workload of the heart is gonna trigger vasodilation via our active hyperemia. Again, I'm gonna go more in depth into this in just a minute here, but this is a result of activating our beta-1 receptors of the heart leading to the increased workload of the heart that we see. Now, when it comes to our parasympathetic in our rest and digest mode, the workload of the heart is reduced. This is reducing the oxygen demand and thus the need for blood. Now again, initially like with the sympathetic response, we do see an opposite reaction as our vagal stimulation is gonna lead to mild vasodilation of the coronary arteries, but the parasympathetic activity is typically gonna lead to decreased activity of the heart, and thus this is gonna reduce oxygen consumption, leading to a reduction of our vasodilatory mediators being released as a result of our active hyperemia. So this means vasoconstriction is going to take place, increasing our vascular resistance, and thus decreasing blood flow as it's no longer needed at this point. All right, and then lastly, let's talk about these vasoactive mediators. So now that we've talked about the process of increasing and decreasing blood flow based on the oxygen demand of the heart, let's talk a little about how all that works. So first we have oxygen and CO2. And simply, our local hypoxemia and hypercarbia um, do lead to vasodilation. Now that said, even with increased workloads, studies have actually shown that typically there's little change in coronary venous PO2 and PCO2. And so this tells us that the regulatory mechanisms work so well that generally a healthy heart can rapidly maintain these levels as the workload increases and decreases. Next is going to be adenosine, and adenosine actually plays a very important role in our active hyperemia and our autoregulation. So its formation is actually increased when hypoxia and increased oxygen consumption takes place through degradation of ATP. So if you think of the name, adenosine triphosphate. And this is even more so when there is an increase in oxygen demand that's really not satisfied by the oxygen supply. And so the presence of adenosine in the coronary vessels actually leads to vasodilation. And this is believed to be one of the stronger mediators in this process. Now, nitric oxide also plays an important role as a vasodilatory mediator. So it serves as a direct receptor-mediated vasodilator, and it also serves as an indirect vasodilator by inhibiting the effects of angiotensin II as well as our sympathetic vasoconstriction. Now, nitric oxide is released by our vascular endothelium, and when it is diffused into vascular smooth muscle, it leads to increases in cyclic GMP, which ultimately causes smooth muscle relaxation and thus vasodilation. And then finally, we have endothelium. 
and endothelium is actually a potent vasoconstrictor, especially in the coronary vessels. Increased levels have actually been found in cases where the physiology would indicate a decreased myocardial oxygen demand. Therefore, we want to see that vasoconstriction to slow down the blood flow going to the heart because it's really no longer needed at that point. And so those are the different mediators that we know of. There are some other potential ones out there that, that are believed to play some roles, but these are kind of the major ones that I wanted to discuss here. And really overall to talk about you know, the process of why that blood flow is important, how it's regulated, again, with that active hyperemia, uh, how that all plays into increasing and decreasing the blood that's going to the heart based on the workload of the heart, the, the oxygen demand that's going on, because really the primary way that we drive increasing or decreasing the oxygen to the heart is by increasing or decreasing the blood flow. So I hope that you guys found this information useful. If you did, please leave me a like on the video down below. Uh, it really helps YouTube know to show this video to other people out there, as well as leave me a comment down below. I love reading the comments that you guys leave, and I try to respond to as many people as I can. Make sure you subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And a special shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you're willing to show me and this channel is truly appreciated, so thank you guys so very much. If you'd be interested in showing additional support for this channel, you can find links to both the YouTube and Patreon membership down below. Head on over there and check out some of the perks that you guys get for doing just that, as well as check out some of the links to other nursing gear, as well as some awesome t-shirt designs I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson that I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, here's a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a great day.